Hello and good time of day, everyone. Uh, welcome to this new MLIR Open Meeting. And today we have uh, Jakob who is going to present about uh, the RFC on uh, Poison Semantics for MLIR. So Jakob, take it away. Thank you. Um, so hi, my name is Jakob. I'm fairly new to MLIR. And last week I posted an RFC for Poison Semantics for MLIR that allow us to model the fair identifying behavior. Um, this presentation doesn't assume you are familiar with the RFC, so I'll try to kind of, you know, start from the beginning, build it up. However, you know, if you want more details, check out the RFC and comment on the RFC. And this work was uh, with with help from Alex, uh, Sanjoy, and Nuno. Um, so uh, I, I'll have some examples. And I divided the you know the talk into a couple of sections, but anytime you have a question or you have some feedback, you know feel free to interrupt me, and uh, you know stop me during the presentation. You don't have to wait until the end. So I, I was working on something called white integer emulation, and the basic idea is that we have some targets that don't support 64-bit operations. So whenever you have a program that has 64-bit integers. Uh, we had to implement them using 32-bit uh, instructions. So here's one example. To make it fit uh, on the screen, I'm using 8 bits and 4 bits instead of 64 and 32, but it's the same. The basic idea is that um, we have a value that's too wide. Go ahead. Paul? OK, maybe no question. Uh, so the basic idea is that we have a weight value, we divide it into halves, and we do have to perform the operation on two halves. So for example, when I have a, sh a shift left by three, uh, my, my high half has one bit remaining from the uh, original high, uh, high half of the value, and now it has three bits from the low half. So I can represent this as a, a shift by left for the, right uh, for the high half, and shift towards the right for the low half. However, if this uh, if this shift is by five, then what happens is that shift by five was perfectly valid for the full uh, I8 type. But if I'm using uh, I4 to implement it, now uh, it's not clear whether I can do a shift left uh, by five on an I4. And uh, you know, in terms of like the convenience. Uh, you know, of the implementation. I would just like to, you know, execute uh, two shifts, knowing that one of them is illegal, and then just select from them. But if you check the spec for the RF dialect, and uh, you see what it says about like shifts under instructions, it doesn't really say what happens when, uh, you know, kind of invalid inputs are, are passed in, at least in most cases. Um, so, so it's not clear if we have to introduce some runtime checks, some control flow, you know, if we have to clamp values, you know, these are all viable options, but um, because the spec doesn't say, it's kind of difficult to know, you know, what is valid, what is not valid, and how to use it. Um, so, so, so I, I think uh, in general, when you think about about like simple low-level ops, they can fall into like three buckets. We have ops with well-defined, uh, you know, results for all inputs. For, exa for example. We can define addition as you know the mathematical addition modulo the tool to the bit width. We have ops with very well known undefined behavior, for example, division by zero. So this is something that you know we generally assume doesn't happen. And if it actually happens in runtime, there are like no guarantees that something will happen or like uh, anything will happen at all. So for example, if we were to to to, to speculate, you know, to introduce some new divisions or to move divisions around. We generally have to be careful so that you know, as we transform the program or as we do lowering, we don't accidentally introduce division by zero. And then we have this third category, which is a sort of gray area. For example, shifts uh, with the with the shifted uh, by value that is greater or equal than the bit width. That you know, we don't expect them to trap, but at the same time, we don't expect them to have any kind of meaningful results. And the question is, you know. Uh, can we, is it still usable? 
uh, should we define it? Should we leave it undefined? If we leave it undefined, you know, what are the properties? How can we use it? Um, so I have an example to illustrate this. So, so first thing, you know, say we perform the, the shift, right? And we suspect uh, that the, the value may be greater or equal to the bit width. Uh, can we compare it, uh, you know, can we compare it to some other number? Is the value of the comparison meaningful? So say here, you know, we are comparing to zero and I would expect that, you know, if we compare to zero, we should be able to divide some other variable by this if it's not zero. However, you know, what happens if this instruction gets duplicated, you know, either manually or by the compiler, you know, can we expect consistent results? And I think unless we improve the spec, unless we kind of have kind of mechanisms, have a language to talk about it, uh, this is a very gray area and this is very difficult to use right now. Um, do you have any questions at this point? Okay, I'll keep going. So, so my goal, goal is primarily, I have two goals. My first goal is so that, you know, we can kind of, uh, we can have like tools, we can have language that allows us to define semantics for these apps. We can put it in documentation or we can put it in, you know, in table gen for the dialects. And, uh, you know, we can just document so that, uh, you know, uh, when we lower to, to say to, to RF or to other dialects, you know, uh, people just know what is legal, what is not legal, and you know how to use ops and how they compose. And, and that the second thing is that you know, once we have that in place, and uh, we kind of define this kind of uh, you know what happens in those cases, we should be able to also reason about it in the compiler. You know, perform optimizations, transformations, and because you know this is MLR, uh, I, I think in general this should be pluggable so that you know this is not only restricted to the building types. Uh, whatever mechanisms we should uh, we come up with should generalize, uh, you know, to, to custom types, custom ops. Um, so, so the, the you know the same thing came up in other compilers and uh, in particular uh, in uh, MLIR. And the solution in MLIR was to introduce uh, something called poison semantics. Uh, LVM uh, roughly defines it like like this. Say you have a, a value i8. That has like regular, you know, um, the, the underlying bit vector representation. So you have all of your regular values from like zero to 255, and then Poisson is an extra value. Uh, so it's like, uh, you know, this is like the value number 256, and you can kind of think about it as a virtual bit that doesn't really, uh, you know, exist anywhere, but it allows us to kind of express this kind of like a new value, and and you know, the same applies to other integer types and so on. And then this poison value can be produced by uh, some, some instructions and the poison constant. Uh, instructions can either propagate poison, stop poison propagation, or some ops trigger immediate unfine behavior when they encounter poison as one of the inputs. And this is described much better in the, in the paper that introduced uh, you know, uh, poison for LVM. So if you want to, to read a good explanation, you know, uh, read the paper, read the LVM uh, reference manual. Um, but I'm I'm gonna give you a condensed version only. So, in LVM, they introduced a, a, a new constant called poison that creates a, a poison value of a given type. And then there's a freeze instruction that unconditionally stops poison propagation. So, if if X was uh, if X was a well-defined value, this is a knob, you just get the same value back. However, if this was uh, the poison value, uh, you know, instead of poison, you, you're gonna get an arbitrary value paved non-deterministically. And uh, there's a tool uh, that allows you to kind of enter those, um, you know, uh, it's very useful because it allows you to kind of reason about transformations with poison, without poison. And uh, I think this makes uh, things a lot easier when you are not sure about, you know, what the spec says or like how to understand it. Uh, so here's one example in uh, LVMIR. So it starts by doing an illegal shift to the right. So this shift would produce poison. Then we add something to it and addition propagates poison. So we get another poison. Then we have a select and we select uh, not the constant, we select the poison value. So we get poisoned again. 
And here uh, we freeze the result of the selection. And once we freeze, this should be any non-deterministic non value. So for example, it would be valid to just, you know, eliminate all of this, this code that does shifting, arithmetic, and selection, and instead just, you know, freeze the, freeze the argument and return it. And if you have, you know, transformations like this in mind, you can put it into a life and it will tell you whether this is valid or not. Um, when it comes to MLIR, the problem is a bit different. Um, on one hand, it's a, a bit easier because, you know, we have an open set of types and ops, so we don't have to kind of move the whole language at once towards the Poison semantics. We can do it gradually. On the other hand, it's a bit more difficult because uh, we have an open set of ops and types. So, uh, we, we, you know, we, we have to come up with something that's kind of, uh, you know, pluggable and general enough. So the proposal is to have a new dialect called UV with uh, operations similar to those from uh, LVM and allow ops and types to opt into uh, poison semantics. And, uh, you know, uh, not every dialect uh, has to opt in. Uh, this is completely optional. And the, uh, what I'm proposing is basically a generalization of the poison semantics from LVM uh, so that, you know, we can use it in MLIR. So in the scalar case, in the scalar case, uh, this is uh, basically the same. Um, so you know, uh, for for example, thinking about like this arithmetic dialect, you know, uh, we would have the uh, UB poison operation that can produce poison values, and then you know we would be able to use it in all of the operations and so on, and then we could you know uh, use uh, use these terms, use these uh, to write some tests, uh, to write some test cases, and explain what's going on with arithmetic operations over scalars. Uh, in the vector case, this is a, a little bit more complicated, but still very similar to LVM. Um, LVM has kind of like one poison bit per vector element. So every vector element can be poisoned separately from the rest. And this allows you to essentially uh, vectorize and scalarize code. So for example, when I have an operation that operates on a vector of the values, uh, I can, you know, uh, I can scalarize them. I can, you know, uh, I, uh, you know I, I can first extract these two values and then perform the operations. Or I can do a reverse transformation where I'm taking a couple of scalar operations and I'm uh, turning them into a vector operation. And this kind of element, when element wise poison enables us to kind of uh, make sure that you know one poison uh, element doesn't kind of contaminate the rest of the values that may be well defined. So, for example, if I have a poison vector and I insert a constant zero and extract it back, I should get back the same uh, constant zero. Um, and I came up with a hypothetical example of a pair type. That kind of combines two arbitrary kind of uh, types, and here this is a bit more tricky. We could also have like one Poisson kind of bit per element, and then uh, you know uh, if the type su supports Poisson semantics, then we have the the bit. If it doesn't, we don't. We could also do a lowest common denominator and say that you know if all types support Poisson, then we can use Poisson for the pair. If some of them don't, then we we can't. Or we could have something like a one poison uh, bit uh, per whole pair. So it's either poison as a whole or not poison as a whole, or well defined as a whole. And here I think this is, uh, you know, th th there are different options. They have different trade offs. And I think it's ultimately up to the dialect to decide, you know, uh, how to implement, uh, you know, poison semantics uh, for its types. Um, any questions at this point? Okay, so uh, I, I think in terms of the implementation, uh, you know, uh, implementation should be detailed enough to cover, you know, uh, what's going on. And if you had, if we had something like a reference MLIR interpreter, you know, we could actually implement this like poison bit as a, as a part of the state and kind of manage it and make sure that everything checks out when we run with the poison bit. 
but the caveat is that you know this poison kind of bit that I'm talking about is is virtual. It doesn't really exist. So the way we define semantics, uh, we have to be careful about it so that we don't over rely on the poison state. For example, we cannot do something like say that an addition of X and poison is always 42 because if we substitute poison with some uh, well-defined value, you know, we, we cannot guarantee that we are going to return 42 in these cases. We cannot tell it apart from other well-defined cases. In terms of implementation, you know, ideally uh, we want to use it in some analysis and transformations, and this should be derived from the, the semantics so that, you know, for example, instead of having to fully represent like, I don't know, like a large te tensor of poison bits, as a, like the shadow state for the actual uh, tensor values, we could have some uh, over approximations. We could say, you know, uh, we could have some sparse representation that only remembers when uh, something is poison and assumes that otherwise something is not poison. But again, uh, this is kind of secondary and this is derived from the, the semantics. Um, and, and here the question is, you know, this sounds pretty uh, complicated. Uh, how do we implement this? And uh, I think the short answer is, I don't know how to do it fully generically right now, but I think it will make sense to start implementing it from bottom up. So start from LVM and in the LVM dialect, uh, it should be fairly easy because it should map one to one to the uh, LVM IR and its semantics. And later we can kind of uh, step it, uh, like move it up to the level of uh, arithmetic to the vector and like similar dialects that are kind of uh, very close to or like they're not that much higher level than something like LVM. And the hope is that you know once we kind of uh, do this exercise and we push it through the lowest level dialects uh, we should be kind of gradually be able to generalize the implementation along the way. And uh, one worry would be that you know is it possible for poison semantics to break existing dialects? And I, I think my answer is that uh, if we do it bottom up, in general, it shouldn't break because if your high level dialect doesn't have anything that produces poison, then it, it doesn't have to worry about poison. And a, a counter example would be something like, I don't know, like a high level element wise operation defined in terms of arithmetic, where you would have to actually worry what happens because, you know, you use the RF uh, op. Uh, you know, in, in your blog or whatever, in your region. Or if you have something like an, I don't know, like a, uh, like an if, and you know, if yields some value defined inside. So, so I think there are some exceptions, but in general, it shouldn't bubble up. Um, and, and this adds, go ahead. If, if I may, um, what do you think about uh, like defining undefined behavior in the arithmetic dialect and you have an existing higher level dialect that lowers to arithmetic but now those lowerings may exhibit undefined behavior because they were you know previously there was no undefined behavior right it was valid to lower one way or another so, so um I, I think that uh, talking about uh, rf and uh, spe specifically it doesn't really define much so uh, you know Right now, you know, if, if you read the spec, you have to be very careful because it just doesn't say what happens. So I think it shouldn't be too bad. And uh, in general, um, uh, like you know, like you can you can think about it in two ways. Like if you don't define what happens, then you have to look at you know uh, the next lowering step. So for example, if RF lowers to LVM and you lower it to RF, then okay, you can check what happens in LVM. No, how is uh, how RF lowers to LVM, and then you can check against LVM. But this is, I think, much less practical because then you would have to check, okay, what are other lowering targets from, uh, say, RF to Spear B? You know, does Spear B follow the same semantics, or is some case defined in LVM but undefined in Spear B, or vice versa? So I think it's much better to just define it uh, higher up. Yeah, no, I agree with your approach. I'm just less optimistic in the fact that nothing will ever break, you know? It's like, we're um, going to define things that are undefined today, and people have been relying on this uh, implementation-specific behavior. But that's fine. I think it's perfectly fine. So, if I may add, so I think the defined behavior is already there today. You just see them, right? Because, say, division by zero is already an independent behavior, right? It's just it's not 
no one wrote it down like that. But if you lower to L10 IR, then that's, it kind of defines implicitly that MLIR as that. Yeah, and I, I think another option is that say, okay, if we, you know, if we go ahead and, you know, define the semantics and realize, okay, there's some op that's really misused. Uh, like, you know, uh, people uh, don't check for these corner cases when they lower it to arithmetic. I think we can always introduce uh, new ops that are more defined. And just, you know, instead of say, uh, emitting something like a, a shift uh, that that is not defined for like large, uh, you know, large shift values, we could define like, I don't know, like a saturating shift that saturates towards zero and use that instead. If, if you know, it's too difficult to, to audit, like, you know, all of the lowering paths. Um, and, but, but the thing is exactly that, you know, this semantic, Poison semantic add a lot of complexity because, you know, now you have one extra value, uh, poison, or like, you know, you can have one poison kind of, uh, kind of bit per element. So it's a lot of more stuff to, to cover in your semantics and a lot of more, more things to worry about. And I think in general, if you can define behavior and, you know, it, it won't introduce too much kind of performance overhead, uh, you know, you should probably define the behavior. If you expect that, you know, you have a, a instruction that you really want to lower to uh, at the end of the day, and you don't want to introduce runtime tracks, and you know that, you know, what you're lowering from uh, won't have to introduce uh, runtime tracks, then, you know, if you can kind of preserve this undefinedness along the way, and you, you know, you can get extra performance by opting into poison semantics, uh, you know, at the expense of this, a lot of extra complexity. Um, but, you know, the benefit is that uh, this is kind of a, a framework that kind of composes well, has no properties. So if you do, op do opt into positive semantics, you know, we know how to handle it. Uh, you know, it, it's not, uh, no, I think once you understand it once, it should be easy to move it to some other dialect. It's not like the poison semantics would be completely different across, you know, all possible dialects. And the vast majority of cases, you just propagate poison. And if you are not sure, you can freeze. And, and as I said, like the implementation is not 100% clear to me. I think this will be done by some, uh, through some type and op interfaces where uh, types will decide, uh, you know, if they can be poison or if they can be, be frozen. Um, and the reason is that I, I don't think, I think it's possible that you cannot freeze all of the values. So for example, in the pair example, even if you have poison as one of the elements, you may not necessarily be able to freeze the other one, something like this. You may not be able to always pick a non deterministic value that makes sense. And, and similarly, if you want to create a poison value and one of the elements cannot be poison, then uh, you know uh, I, I don't think it makes sense to define a poison constant that initializes the other one to some non-poison value. Um, but I'm not 100% sure about this. Uh, can I interrupt? Can you explain why a value cannot always be frozen? Uh, I, I wonder, mm -hmm. as long as the type has at least one value that can be default initialized. Yeah, so, so I, I had this one example that I came up with that's kind of a bit higher level. So say you have something like a, a file handle or some resource handle. You would expect uh, the frozen value you know, you would expect a non-deterministic choice to be kind of usable to some extent, right? But I think you cannot always come up with a valid, like, I know, file handle that you can kind of come up with out of thin air. Um, so I, I think there may be cases where uh, you, you cannot perform this arbitrary choice. It doesn't make sense. So if I may rephrase, are you thinking about objects that do not have a default initializer? So in those cases, you cannot uh, freeze a value? Mm -hmm. Um, no, it's, it's more like, uh, it, it, I, for example, like you could have a file handle that's like some uh, null value that says, okay, uh, it doesn't point to any file, right? But uh, I'm not sure if that, you know, if, if you were to, I, I don't think if, if you run without this poison bit, I don't think you can detect that. And I don't think you can turn it into some, uh, you know, handle that can be used by anything because, you know, 
presumably, you know, something that produces you a garbage handle, which we talk about as poison, and you cannot turn it into something useful. Like there is, I, I don't think, you know, it makes sense in some, some examples like this. Uh, but in general, I expect poison to be most useful for like uh, very kind of like primitive types. So something like, you know, uh, integers, uh, vectors, tensors. I'm not, I don't think we have a use case for higher level types right now. I'm not sure I totally followed what you mean by transforming it into something useful. So is it about freeze? Yeah. Maybe, maybe you could explain again why. Why would freeze make sense for an integer and not for a file handler? Uh, because it, uh, you know you, you can easily come up with an arbitrary integer, right? And I know if you perform an addition or a lot of other operations, in a lot of cases you can still use it and it's perfectly fine. Um, uh, but I think for sometimes it's possible that you know once you have an invalid value or like you know some random value, there's like no way in which you can meaningfully use it. So why would you freeze? So are you explicitly like thinking a freeze should be random or it's up to the implementer to decide the value? Uh, no, so um, so again, because you cannot check poison, like there's no poison bit, right? Freeze cannot really check if the value is poison or not. So it has to just come up with a kind of a bit pattern uh, no, for your type. But I'm saying that uh, I think there are some cases where if you just come up with an arbitrary bit pattern for your type, this value cannot be useful in any meaningful way. Yeah, maybe I, I don't understand. You might talk about it later. I'm thinking about this as you now similar to maybe of t, right? Uh, uh, it may hold a value of type t or none, right? And there are semantics for propagating these. And I wonder how. As long as t can be default initialized, you can go from maybe of t to t, right? I, I see freeze is equal to that, uh, but maybe you no, be, discuss this later. The whole trick is that we cannot check for poison. There's no poison bit when we actually run stuff. You know, when we have an integer, we are not adding one extra bit to the integer to, to have poison. Like uh, you should be able to substitute poison with an arbitrary, uh, you know, value, and you know, it, it should still make sense. Um, how do you differentiate a file on the whole on a pointer for the purpose of freeze? Because freeze works with pointers, right? Um, uh, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I, I would need to think about this. So maybe you know, if you have, um, if you want to talk about it, maybe we can continue offline on the RSC thread, or uh, I don't know. I, I don't have a good example right now. Okay, thanks. I mean, um, my, my sense of it is that freeze on what in the IR is poison gives you whatever it was the underlying instructions actually did, which we don't know what that is because, you know, like with shifts over, like, is that all zeros? Is that, you know, who knows? You get whatever the value is, assuming you haven't crashed your program by then. And yeah. at that point, it's basically like, okay, if the the, the point of, of freeze is basically acknowledging, okay, if, if we ran into, if we did something illegal, then we just want to roll with it, basically. Yeah. We're just, yeah, we're, so we're going to just let the illegal behavior continue, you know, this unknown value from this illegal op, we just keep propagating it because... Uh, that's what someone asked for at some point. And if it crashes their program, it crashes their program. Whoops. Uh, yeah, so, so the basic guarantee is that every use of the same freeze gives you the same value. Yeah. So, you know, if, if, you, if you were to kind of duplicate this instruction, uh, you know, if you cannot guarantee it gives you the same bit pattern, you cannot duplicate it. You have to use the same result, you know, across all users. Uh, the, uh, yeah, I, I mean, right, because that's right, because that's a, as distinct from like a full-on undefined where you got nothing. Um, so, so I'm not 100% sure about it. I think 
this is I, I don't know if it's super important at this point i think maybe the kind of the initial implementation will kind of inform this maybe we don't need so much complexity in the interface Any other questions? OK, um, in that case, if you have any other questions, you know, feel free to ask them offline. You know, either message me directly or reply under the RFC thread. Or uh, you know, come and talk with me okay, around but, the uh, conference. But, um, but, so what's the plan bring forward? So, who is going to implement these and, and what? Uh, what do you mean? Sorry. Can, uh, so, can you repeat that question? Yeah, sorry. Um, what's the so who is going to implement the your proposal and, and, and what's the expected final ones? So, so uh, sorry. So, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, like as, as I said, like my initial plan for the implementation was to first, you know, uh, agree on the on the kind of the, the language and stuff in the documentation. So it'll be like the first step, so that you know we can, you know, if somebody wants to uh, update their dialect, so that you know it, it explains what's going on in those cases. You know, they can do it. And, and as a second step, I just wanted to start the implementation and first uh, add uh, poison and freeze to to the LVM dialect, and later move from there and add it to, to RF and Vector. I'm not sure if this answers your question. And I think at that point, once we have some implementation experience, maybe we can have another RFC that, that explains, you know, how to kind of generalize it uh, fully to, so that, you know, it's fully opt-in for other dialects. If you want to ask a question, but you don't want to unmute yourself, you can always ask them in writing. Happy to address them, so like that. Wants to ask questions. The LLVM dialect now has like fast math flags. Are we going to be using those to affect how undefined behavior works in the LLVM dialect, or are we going to leave that up to LLVM IR? Um, uh, so like. Uh, I don't know the LVM dialect very well, but uh, isn't it true that basically it doesn't optimize that much, and like all of the optimizations are basically left to the you know to the LVM compiler? Yeah, but if yeah. we're bringing in the poison semantics to the LLVM dialect, and they actually affect how um, the LLVM. So, for example, if you want to if you want to implement if we're going to implement a generic analysis and optimization path on poison stuff. Right. Does this need to be aware of the any like fast math flags that might exist on the LLVM ops? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. What kind of fast math do you expect affect undefined behavior? I don't remember the exact flags, but some of them like um, I think just don't check. No, I'm not sure if it only affects like uh, some of the like library calls or intrinsics. Um... Uh, so fast math flag in LVM mostly affect what kind of like the values that you can replace with. So you, you say, oh, now um, commutativity is legal and things like this. So it, it will not produce poison because of that fast math flag. So Actually, I, I just checked. There are two fast math flags that will affect poison. Uh, it's non-nan and non-infinity. Ah, yeah. yeah, those are the ones I didn't look them up. So I think Is we could have thing? like hooks in the interface for this, or are we going to have like a dialect interface? 
Um, so so I, I, I don't know the details. Um, again, like I, I'm not familiar with the LVM dialect, but I, I think that basically, you know, uh, kind of having this, you know, documented in the, you know, in the documentation and actually having some optimizer that's kind of smart enough to exploit it are two different things. So I think it's fine to, to say us that, you know, con, you know, this is what happens, you know, in, in the kind of dialect spec, but not have any kind of analysis or any transform that can exploit it. I, I think that's fine. So, but I think it's important, you know, like long term to have these things in an LIR, because then if you know that, for example, modern store and, and or you know, whatever, then when you lower between uh, dialects, then you can actually check the correctness, right? So that you are uh, not lowering to some wrong IR. And I think we can have that kind of tool to be automatic once we have that semantic vision. I think that's, that's a very good vision. We don't have anything else. Ben mentioned in chat that uh, having this also in speedy dialect, which is not. So I think if if you plan to start from the looks, I love maybe to the FDM and the rhythm. So. Jeff, you kind of started breaking up for me, and, and I didn't hear the last part, but I think that the comment from you and Ben is basically that it will be also good to, to look into the, this previous situation because, you know, this is another IR, or like another dialect that RF lowers to. And I think it's previous this will be useful, but the situation is a little bit more complicated because the this PV oh. IR doesn't have a uh, poison increase. It has undef, which is very similar to the undef in um uh, in LVM prior to poison freeze. Um so so I, I think we would have to be careful so that you know we don't introduce something that we cannot lower to SPV. So for example, right. I don't think you can as soon as you have any freeze, I think you, I don't think you can lower to to SPV. Right. But you could evaluate it before you lower it, right? Like if, if what we're talking about here is introducing the poison so that in the Arith dialect we can start to do optimizations safely, you know, fold fold the freeze to you know known values before we go to Spear V. Then we don't have to have Spear V support all the poison semantics. Is that correct? No, because uh, so, so if you, if you can statically tell that something is poison, you know, you can you can uh, then you can uh, replace freeze with an arbitrary constant, right, or an arbitrary value. If you don't know, then you know um, you, you have to make sure that everything checks out when you're in without poison. So, for example, if you say that you know uh, branching on poison is undefined, and you freeze so that you don't branch on poison, you branch on some arbitrary value, we may not be able to lower it meaningfully to spree. You just have to kind of avoid optimizations that rely on freeze. Not not be able to lower it meaningfully or not at all. Like, can uh, is is it legal to strip? You know, say say we did the optimizations, we did what we could, and then, you know, it, it's status quo today is that poison is not there and not doing any of this stuff. So, uh, it, do we do we get any incremental benefit even if we can't get the full full thing? Yeah. So okay, I have this diagram on the screen. So this is goes from the most defined behavior to the least defined behavior. And, and, and I think the rule is roughly like this, that 
you should be able to always uh, reduce the amount of undefinedness as you lower. So for example, if you have poison, you should be able to uh, replace it with a defined value or with undef. Um, you know, if we had a freeze of something, then uh, we may not be able to do that, right? So we have to uh, avoid freeze. And, I, you know, freeze, I, I think, you know, if it doesn't, if no front end generates it, the solution is basically, you know, don't, don't introduce it uh, during your optimizations. If your optimization introduces freeze and you know that you cannot lower freeze, then, you know, you avoid these optimizations, you don't do them. And at the end of the day, if you were to just, you know, skip any freezes and just lower to undef, uh, like, you know, you know, if you were to skip freezes and just, you know, use the value that you freeze instead, you are, you're risking miscompiling because, you know, this preview optimizer may be able to, you know, to, to find something more and misoptimize based on this. Yeah. Are there, it, this, this is just for my curiosity, are there visible effects where that would be any different than the undefined behavior at runtime? So, so, so that, that's the thing, right? Because we're saying that the, this is not undefined behavior, this kind of uh, the cases in this gray area, right? So it's possible that you'll end up with like inconsistent behavior. That for example, you know, if you have freeze, uh, maybe you check if the frozen value is not zero and if it's not, you divide by it, right? If you cannot freeze, it's possible that you check by zero. You use, okay, and you say, this is fine. I should be able to divide by it. And then, you know, the value that you divide by is actually, you know, you observe it to be zero and you miscompile. Yeah. Um, but but if you ran that at runtime, you would still be dividing by zero. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying, trying to get a feel for here. No, is like, no, that's this only useful if you can ever lower to LLVM that has poison semantics, or can we get any value of this in any other case? It's, it's, worse, it's worse than that. So, so first, there is no, there's not always undefined behavior at runtime. Like often there is, there's not. It's like the, the, the x86 spec, for example, will define, you know, the addition and everything. So even if your IR says that you're not allowed to overflow your signed arithmetic, um, when you get to emit the final binary, there's no actual undefined behavior at runtime uh, in many cases. Um, and so most of the undefined behavior will be exploited by compiler transformation in very surprising ways. That, that's where that's where you get the problem. And and here to me, because we talk about PRV on the, the, the freeze semantic, the problem is that here we, we may get into a situation where we have defined value, we can get we we can um, use poison in optimization to have aggressive optimization. Um, but if we lower to a, to a, a dialect, and that's why. Uh, Jacob was, was saying we need to go bottom up. If we lower to a dialect that doesn't have freeze and poison, that means some optimization will have been over, over aggressive and lower to SPRV and lose the information about the freeze, meaning suddenly the SPRV optimizer will be able to, you know, basically, basically exhibit undefined behavior where there was no undefined behavior before, for example. It's, okay. It's, so that, that that, that's interesting. The assertions here, and I guess the the desire to have the stuff documented in Rith is interesting because for me, if if you're targeting, you know, multiple platforms that might have differences in how they actually interpret the stuff, that is to me targeting multiple platforms undefined behavior, even if one of those platforms has defined behavior and one doesn't. And if we're able to use this to get that information earlier on, that you know, we 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 are compiling the Spear V and maybe on two different drivers. It produces different results because we were relying on this, you know, or we're we're lowering to LVMIR, but we might be going to ARM or x86 or, or different variants. Like th this could be useful for that, maybe. Um, so is that I, not I, true? Uh, I, I, so so like I don't know, like oh, oh, oh. I think that there's some like slight mismatch in the story you're kind of describing to me. I would need to you know think about it more, but I think in general. Uh, the question may, maybe can be rephrased to something like this. Is poison useful when you cannot freeze? And I think the answer is yes. There, there's, you know, it allows you to explain, like justify a lot of optimizations and say what happens in those cases. And I think freeze takes you one step further where, you know, it enables you, it allows you to, opt it, to, to aggressively optimize in kind of more ways than poison without freeze. But, you know, you can use it without freeze uh, you know, it doesn't make poison useless. But 
the theme can be at something. Um, so uh, I think the biggest problem here is that uh, Sphere V doesn't have well-defined semantics for undefined behavior, right? So it's, it's hard for me to give a definitive answer for what you're asking. But, uh, but the fact that Sphere V doesn't have trees, it means that it may be less expressive than the Elgon name. I am. So it may be theoretically impossible to lower everything from one to the other. But I mean, in, in the theory, we are uh, at least. But it may be possible to do some hack, right? Because you can always pass through some function that you know kind of cleans up the value as, as a hack and just, you know, an edited function that is just to clean up the value. And then it kind of makes it safe in practice. So. Um, um, so, um, so, so, I mean, I'm happy to look into the issue if someone wants to go through the screen and, and, and make it more easy. But there, there may be a theoretical issue as well. Okay, if that's it, we can get back seven minutes. Last call. We can also take the last five minutes to talk about any other topic anyone would want to talk about. If anyone has questions or things totally unrelated to undefined behavior, happy to take any question as well. Next week, there won't be any uh, online meeting because it's the MLIR Summit in San Jose. So we are all going to be also, sorry, some of you may be in uh, California next week and we'll meet and have a few talks and drinks, hopefully. All right, if there is another topic. We can leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, Jakob, for uh, this presentation. It was very nice of you to start from almost zero so that people not familiar with the topic could also get the introduction. And uh, I'm looking forward to iterate on the implementation. Um, and uh, let's do that online. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. And see you next time. <laughs>